So let me welcome all of you online and everybody here. We're in chapter four of Jonah, our final chapter, and perhaps perhaps the most convicting chapter in the book. More than last week. Uh, yeah, more than last week. Um, so let me start with a quick story of perspective. There was a farmer who had a cow, and the cow gave birth to twin calves. Twin calves. Miraculous. The farmer comes rushing in to his wife. He says, honey, Bessie had twin calves. She said, that's marvelous. And he said, I think I have a great idea. We're going to keep one and dedicate the other one to the Lord. So one will be our calf, the other will be the Lord's calf. She said, that's a fantastic idea. Days go by. He comes in one night for dinner. He's very sad, very mournful. She said, honey, what happened? He said, I was just in the barn, and the Lord's calf died. <laughs> when we talk about perspective, let's take, a, let's take a running look at Jonah and perspective as we launch into chapter 4, because here's the point. In chapter 4, we get what most scholars say this would be a fantastic book if we put a period at the end of chapter 3. Nineveh's saved. Jonah's saved. The soldiers, the, the sailors are saved. Everybody's saved. This would be a great ending to the book, except God's not through with Jonah. He's not done with Jonah. And the thing that he wants Jonah to fully understand is what God has done from God's perspective. He wants Jonah's attitude course corrected. He wants Jonah to see God's point of view and God's perspective. He wants Jonah to see all the calves are his. <laughs> That's what he wants him to see, and that he's blessed them abundantly. So on a quick review, and I'm going to read this quick review because it's a lot of fun to read. God says, go west. Jonah goes east. God brings up a storm. Jonah goes down into the ship. The sailors throw everything out, including Jonah. God brings the storm down. The sailors lift up their hands in prayer and praise. Jonah goes into the fish. He goes down to the bottom of the sea, bows in humility. The fish spits him out. Jonah goes west to Nineveh. Nineveh goes down in humility and forgiveness for their wickedness and comes up saved. End of chapter 3. Period. Marvelous. Fantastic. Except for Jonah. And as we look at Jonah's character throughout this, what we see is a disobedient, repentant, obedient but not happy, angry. We see this over and over again with Jonah that his character doesn't align with God's character because what we see of God's character is this. Compassion, 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 compassion. Compassion on Jonah multiple times, on the sailors, on the Ninevites. Why? They are his creation. Christ died so that who could be saved? All. Why? He loves them. They are his creation. And his desire is that all would be saved. So we start... <laughs> In verse 10 of chapter 3, as we get this running look into this final chapter, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God's looking overall for this perspective. I'm going to bring judgment upon you unless you turn from your evil ways that you have risen up against me. If you'll turn... I won't destroy. What did God want all along for Nineveh to be saved? The plan comes into play. Jonah finally is obedient. And even though he's obedient, is he really happy about this? No. So the stage is set. Nineveh is saved. Should there be shouting and screaming and rejoicing? And let's look at verse 1 of chapter 4. What's the first word you see there? Love it. And that means contrast. 
the contrast to God who has said Jonah's been or, or Nineveh has been saved is Jonah. <laughs> it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Now let's just ask the quick question: Who's he angry at? God. And why is he angry at God? He's compassionate. <laughs> he, he's angry at God because God did exactly what God said he would do, <laughs> which was something good or bad. Good. So wait a minute. Jonah's angry at God because God did something good. <laughs> well, we're going to get to that part of the story, even though he didn't like it. God, you did something. Do you see the irony here? God, I'm angry at you because you saved all these people. He just didn't like those people. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's the perspective shift we want to see. Did God love these people? Yeah. Did God want to be saved? Mm -hmm. Come on, Jonah, get on God's side. Let's see this from God's perspective. But Jonah's saying, no, now there's a reason why. And we may think from a human perspective, there's a really good reason why Jonah didn't want them to be saved. And here's the reason. The Assyrians... It is prophesied through Amos and Hosea that the Assyrians would eventually come down and defeat Israel. So here's Jonah's human thinking. God, if you destroy the Ninevites, guess who gets saved? Israel. But here's God's point. If I save Nineveh, then I also save Israel. Because if the Ninevites come to me, they're not going to come down and destroy Israel. God's perspective is a win-win in all the categories. Jonah's perspective is, I'm just looking for this one thing. They're my hated enemy. What's God wanting to do with Jonah? Change your perspective. Change how you see things. Change it and see them as my creation. Now, I think it's really fascinating that the phrase that's used here, he became angry. This is Jonah now who becomes angry. In the Hebrew, is translated this way. It was literally translated evil. His anger is an evil anger. His anger is something that God needs to change because this anger is an evil anger, and that evil anger is a sinful anger. So what does is, what is God ultimately want Jonah to be? A really good prophet or a really bad prophet? He wants him to be a really good prophet. And in order to be a really good prophet, where does his character have to turn? Away from evil or to evil? And here's Jonah just get this. This is God's prophet who is looking at God and saying, you are wrong. Excuse me? Uh, you, you really want to say that to me? This is this translated. It was evil to Jonah with a great evil. Now, that's how the Hebrew literally translates he was angry. It was evil to Jonah with a great evil, which, by the way, is also how who is described. The Ninevites, they're described with that same great evil that Jonah is now described with that evil. Do you see what God, why God wants to change this? Why did he save the Ninevites? Because their evil had risen up against God. But it displeased Jonah that God did a good thing and his evil rises up against God. There's nothing different here. Other than an entire nation rising up against God, there's nothing different here in, in the attitude of Jonah versus the attitude of the Ninevites. Now, I will say, in defense of Jonah, there's a reason why he's scared for the nation of Israel. He doesn't want them destroyed. And in the same case, he does not take that evil into a, a violence as the Ninevites did. But even from that perspective, this is the same character that God has wanted to save the Ninevites from that would bring about their destruction. It's the same character that he wants to save Jonah from. And again, the irony of this whole thing is God has just done a magnificent work and Jonah's angry at it. The prophet of God is angry at God for doing the good that only God can do. 
And what we're going to find out here in just a second is that Jonah, what Jonah's really trying to say to God is, I don't want you to be God. Because I don't want you to be good. I want you not to be the God that I know you to be. We're, this, when this unfolds, this is really, really spectacular. So he displeased John, it displeased John next evening. He became angry to the point of anger. God had all the right reasons to be angry at Jonah, didn't he? Mm -hmm. You disobeyed me. You ran away from me. You went to the, as far away from me as you could. You didn't obey me. And now, when I've done this magnificent thing, you're angry. Mm -hmm. did, his character. Absolutely. Did, did God have the right to just take Jonah out at any point in time? Oh, sure. yeah. You know, to have that kind of anger against God. Here's the beautiful thing about God. <laughs> He doesn't. He stays in it. Because there is a purpose that God wants to bring about in Jonah. He wants his character shifted. He wants him moved because he wants to use Jonah magnificently. And by the way, has he just used him magnificently? Jonah, you went in and used your gift. You preached and an entire city of people came to know me. What a spectacular thing to do. You know, you'd love to be seeing Jonah high-fiving God right now. You know, fist bumps all around because the Ninevites are saved. And yet, this is the perspective that Jonah has. Now, before I get too down on Jonah, look at verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord. Something Jonah did really well is he went straight to the source. So he had a conversation with God. God, let's talk about this. Now, it is, it's really interesting because here's where we know his perspective is bad. Between verse 2 and verse 3, the pronoun I is used nine times in two verses. What's Jonah's perspective? Is it God's perspective or me? It's me, me, myself, and my, and it is God. You didn't do it the way I think you should have done it. You did it wrong. So he has a conversation, and by the way, he has a conversation with Yahweh. This is now the, the name for God is turned back to the covenant keeping God of Israel. So who's he dealing with? He's now not dealing with the almighty God, the Elohim. He's now dealing with the one who keeps his covenant with Israel, who is who Jonah is. And by the way, who Jonah is representing. Don't lose that fact. So God allows Jonah to be angry. Isn't this a marvelous thing? God allows Jonah to get it all out, to just lay it on the line. I'm going to tell two stories on my wife. The first one I'm going to tell on my wife is this. She got angry at God one day, stood up on the toilet seat, and shook her fist at God. This was years and years and years ago, and then slipped off the toilet. So it was one of those things, that, you know, maybe I need a duck. The beautiful thing is God listened, and he was patient, and he was loving, and he was merciful, and he was full of grace. Grace. This is what he's doing with Jonah right now. So listen to the prayer. Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? So listen to what Jonah says. You see, God, I was right. You were going to be good. You were going to be compassionate. You were going to be merciful. And I didn't want you to be. You see, I knew exactly what you were going to do. You were going to be the good God that you are. Mm -hmm. You see the irony in this? Mm -hmm. I'm angry at God because he did exactly what God is supposed to do. Be good. Save a country. Save a nation. Save people. And he used me to do it, by the way. I had the privilege of being able to bring the message. But you did exactly what I knew you were going to do. And by the way, God, I was right. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> you know, those are those statements that at times I do want to just take a quick step back for the lightning bolt to not yeah. hit right where I was standing. Um, now, again, this is what, what Jonah says. Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. I left because I knew you were going to do this, and I didn't want to be a party to you being good. <laughs> I didn't want to be part of this really good thing that was going to happen because I knew you were going to be a good God. 
And you're going to save those people. And by the way, I don't like those people. <laughs> and I don't want you to save those people. Because my view of God is so small that I never realized if you saved them, you saved us. And God's perspective is you're missing it. It's here. It's available. It's open to you. My goodness, my graciousness, my mercy, my loving. It's, it's all right here for you. And what do you do? You run away from me. That's why I fled to Tarshish, for I know, for I know that you are a gracious, gracious and merciful God. And how does He know this? Was He gracious and merciful to Jonah, with the wind and the sea and the fish and the Ninevites? Was He gracious and merciful countless times to Jonah? Yes. Now, do we see Jonah going and thank you, God, for being gracious and merciful to me? Don't see that. Still got to change that character. So I fled to Tarshish. I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Now, I want, I want to translate this. This is a Mark Ray paraphrase, so don't take this to the bank. But this is what Jonah is saying. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, and I don't want you to be. Now, I want you to be gracious and merciful to me, but I don't want you to be gracious and merciful to them. Remember, grace means, it's from the Hebrew word, ken, and grace means withholding, or giving me what I don't deserve. So, God, you gave them what they don't deserve. I don't want you to be merciful, withholding what I do deserve. Was he merciful to Jonah all the time, withholding from Jonah what he deserved at every point in this place? I don't want you to do this to them. Now, I want you to be gracious and merciful to me, but not to anybody else. I want you to be quick to anger. I want you to be quick to anger to the Ninevites. I want you to wipe them off the face of the earth right now. But I don't want you to do that to me even though I deserved it at every step. I want you to be abundant in loving kindness. That loving kindness, it's a Hebrew word, chesed, and it means loyal love. I want you to be loyal in your love to me, but I don't want you to be loyal in your love to the Ninevites. I want you to hate the Ninevites like I hate them. You see, this, the dripping irony here is just off the charts. Finally, I don't want you to be one who relents from doing harm. I want you to do harm. Mm -hmm. And I want you to harm the Ninevites. Mm -hmm. In other words, what Jonah is saying to God is, I want you not to be God. Mm -hmm. I do not want you to do what I know and who I know you are. Now, the really interesting part about this is that Jonah knows who God is. He knows him to be gracious. He knows him to be merciful. He knows him to be one who is slow to anger. He knows he is one who is loving, kind, who has loving kindness, loyal love, and he knows he's one who relents from doing harm. This is how he can describe him this way, and yet what he's asking him to do is not be who you are. I want you to be the opposite of who you are. And I'll say it again, the selfishness here is, first of all, you see, I know I'm right. Second, I want you to be all those things to me, but I don't want you to be those to anybody else. The character that has to shift in Jonah is really, really significant. So everything that God expressed to Jonah, he wants him to continue to express, but he doesn't want him to express those to the Ninevites. Literally, what Jonah is saying to God is, it is your fault. It's your fault that the Ninevites are saved. It's your fault that I'm still here. It's your fault that good is going to come of this. It's your fault. I mean, does, does this sound from Garden of Eden? Does this sound familiar? <laughs> when sin occurs, who does Adam blame? God, you gave the woman to me. God, it's your fault. You gave her to me. And then it's her fault. And she said, it's Satan's fault. The serpent made me do it. Everybody places blame on anybody but themselves, and the first place we place blame is on God. 
that sin is what God needs to shift in Jonah. And well, yes, he needs to shift it in me on a number of occasions, yes. I think this is just so convicting because <laughs> um, you can be, and I, I talk about myself, but I, I think it's pretty much over the board like this. You can be so angry at someone or just on out, and maybe they want prayer for themselves for something, and maybe you, well, I'll pray, but in my heart, I'm not really praying for them. I mean, I, I'm so guilty of that myself. I, when we get that, amen. Thank you for sharing that. When we get to the end of this, I'm going to conclude this whole thing with a quote. And that quote is really the prayer to see the Jonah in us and to see that change. Mm -hmm. This is going to be why when we get to the end of this little chapter that we're going to see Jonah leaves it open-ended because the story's not finished. Because God still wants to do a work in you and me, too. Yeah. When Jesus said that they wouldn't be the sign except the sign of Jonah, so is this part of it then? Well, that's Israel not yes. wanting the Gentiles to be Absolutely. drafted in. Yes. No question about it. Great point. Okay. Now, verse 3. Since you're going to be the kind of God you're going to be, Therefore, now, Lord, yeah, just kill me. Just say, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die. It's better for me to die than to live with a God who does good. Wow. <laughs> Do you see how messed up his perspective is? Mm -hmm. It's better for me to be dead than to be alive with a God who would save the Ninevites. It's better for me to be dead than to be alive with a God who would save me over and over. And it would better to be dead than to be alive with a God who is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and loving kindness and one who relents from, it's better for, just, God, just take me out of here. Just wipe me, I don't want to be here. Wow. That's, that is one of those that I would take a step back because the lightning bolt's coming down and going to hit. And, and just to see how, how messed up Jonah's perspective is to get them to that point. And I'll share a quick story, um, a personal story. When I was in business, um, I had one account when we lived in Dallas. It was a large oil company, and we were doing a major graphic changeover for this large company. And it was not going well. And the 4th of July had occurred. We'd come down for the, the whole Melissa, the boys, and myself had come down to Houston, because we were living in Dallas at the time, come down to Houston for our 4th of July company picnic. And I knew when I went back to Dallas on Sunday afternoon, when Monday arrived, all of the principal partners from this oil company were coming in to view all that we had done. And I knew it wasn't finished. And over and over again, that whole weekend, I was thinking to myself, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna get fired and I'm gonna lose my job, and it's gonna be over. Mm. And I went to sleep Saturday night. I couldn't swallow. The stress was off the charts. And I said, Lord, it's probably gonna be better for you to take me right now <laughs> because Melissa and the boys will have the insurance money. They'll be able to pay off the house. They will be just fine. So, Lord, just, Take, can I can I identify with Jonah? Absolutely, Lord. It's better for me if you would take me now. Just and I laugh about that because I think about the fact that He took me back. Everything worked out just fine. And look at what God has done with me and moved me into uh, ministry applications that I would just I praise Him daily for what He's done. And if God had been, if God had aligned with me. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be here. And I think of everything that I would have missed, all that, have, that I would have not been a participant in, in my own family, if God had listened to me and taken me. Now, I wasn't angry at God, but in the same respect, my perspective was so skewed. You remember that old video that used to come up on YouTube with the lady who had the nail in her forehead? Do you remember that one? And she's looking at her husband. She's saying, 
I just, I can't, I have these headaches all the time. And he's trying to point to the nail and say, you got to, don't tell me, don't fix me. I just want you to hear me. Mm -hmm. I have this headache. I can't get rid of it. And he's looking at her going, if you would just take the nail, don't tell me. I don't want to be fixed. I want to be feeling this way. And I just want you to hear me. This is almost what Jonah says. And what God says is, no, I'm not going to leave you there. I'm not going to leave you in this place. Because there's something in you that has to shift. So we get this magnificent statement from God, and this is how God responds. Are you ready for this? Verse 4. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, stop. Just stop for a minute. And ask yourself the question, is it right for you to be angry? Now, what question is he really asking? Is it right for you to be angry at me? Is it right for you to be angry at me? You have been disobedient. You have been unrepentant. You have been, you've been difficult. You've not <laughs> followed my direction. And now you're angry at me. Is it right for you to be angry at me? And really what God is saying, is it right, is it right for you to be angry at me when I've done this magnificent work? through you is it right for you to be angry with me notice does jonah respond does he answer no um yeah I, see see here's the whole point god is trying to get jonah to see everything from his perspective and it reminds me of the story of these three elderly guys who are out playing golf one day three did I say elderly? Yeah. Three elderly guys. And they're, two of them are complaining about everything. The grass is too high. The fringe is too high. The greens are too fast. The wind's blowing too hard. And finally, the third one, who hasn't said a single thing, looks at the other and says, at least we're on the right side of the grass. <laughs> <laughs> we're still here. We're still alive. Perspective shift, Jonah. God's trying to get you to see to snap you out of it and see the magnificence of God around you. Mm -hmm. So practical, I yes. Pity and anger kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, they do. <laughs> well, and from this perspective, when I'm angry, who am I pitying? Yourself. Myself. <laughs> Poor, pitiful me, because God's been good to me. Great point. Dr. Douglas Young, in his commentary, translates this question this way. Is doing good displeasing to you, Jonah? I save Nineveh because I'm in the saving business. I save sinners. I wanted you to bring them the message of judgment to see whether or not they would turn to me. If they did, I'd save them. They did, and I saved them. If there's joy in heaven over one sinner turning to God, think about the party when all of Nineveh turned to me. Is this displeasing to you? Jonah, change your perspective. Again, Jonah doesn't answer, but verse 5 gives us what Jonah does. And I want you to mark this in big letters because you can say this is Mark Ray. Jonah goes and pouts. Watch it. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. He made himself a shelter, sat in it under the shade, till he might see what would become of the city. Mm. Now, here's what he's saying. He goes out, he pouts, he doesn't answer God's question. He's sitting outside the city. He puts a little lean-to up in front of him, so he's got shade and from the desert sun. And he's looking at the city because he doesn't believe that they've actually repented. He doesn't believe that they've actually done it. And so what he's actually doing, he's sitting there and he's waiting for them to rise up against God and for God to destroy him. Because that's what he still thinks is the right thing. He goes out and he pounces. Mm -hmm. He did not want to believe that they would stick with their repentance. He still wants to see them destroyed. His perspective is just plain wrong. And that's what anger does. Anger shifts your perspective. This is why we're told to be slow to anger. Give it some time. See what happens. 
Well, now I'm going to tell another story on my wife. <laughs> She's given me the, the, the approval to do this when she was five years old. Five years old. She got very angry at her mother. She went up into her room. She packed her suitcase. She came down and told her mother she was running away from home. Her mother said, okay. <laughs> she grabbed all of her great possessions. She stuffed them in that suitcase, took the suitcase out, walked across her yard to the very corner of the yard, put her suitcase down and sat right there. She sat there for hours. Aww. Her mother would peek out, came down, brought her a sandwich, brought her a little something to drink. <laughs> Finally, the neighbor walks by and says, what are you doing? She said, I'm running away from home. The neighbor said, well, you're sitting right here in the corner. Why are you doing that? She said, I'm not allowed to cross the street. <laughs> perspective though God was only going to give him so much rope until he was going to pull him back so now we're going to watch God pull him back this is really fun while Jonah is out pouting God's preparing to change him God's preparing to change who his character is to get him to see it and here's what happens Jonah's out there he's pouting he's built himself a lean-to he's looking to see and he's ready for the for God to actually still destroy Nineveh. And the Lord, verse 6, prepared a plant. Now that word prepared, we know from chapter 1, means he anointed. He actually, this is God intervening in his creation to do something that creation doesn't normally do. He prepared a plant and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. Now there's a couple of things to notice here. This is really fun. There's a tremendous amount of scholarship out there trying to decide what kind of a plant was this. <laughs> because they're trying to make this realistic, just like there was a lot of scholarship of what kind of fish was it. Mm. What kind of plant is this? Friends, let me just tell you, there is no plant in the world that you can plant and in one day grows to create shade. over. It doesn't exist. That plant does not exist. This is God anointing a plant to bring shade to Jonah. Mm. Does Jonah deserve the shade? No. This is a gracious gift of God for Jonah while Jonah is pouting. Notice while the pouting's going on, God's doing a work. So God prepares a plant, makes it to come up over Jonah, brings comfort and protection to Jonah, even while Jonah's being a five-year-old. <laughs> and notice, Jonah was very grateful for the plant. This is the first time in the entire chapter that Jonah's been happy about anything. Did he do anything about it? Did he create the plant? Did he plant the plant? Did he fertilize the plant? Did he water the plant? No. This is God who has created shade for Jonah. And look at the passage here. To deliver him from his misery. Let me just tell you how this translates in the Hebrew. To rescue him from his moral evil attitude <laughs> this is what God is doing what he's preparing for Jonah is a way to rescue him from his own sin this is what God is doing why Jonah needs to become the prophet that God now did God have every right to say Jonah forget you I'm gonna to go to another prophet could have done this at any time. And here, Jonah's pouting. God brings a plant up. He anoints a spectacular plant. And notice, Jonah doesn't sit there and go, hmm, that plant grew over my head in one day. Wow, this must be God. Mm -hmm. No. He said, it does say he's grateful for it. But this is what God is doing in order to prepare him to get him out of this sinful attitude to deliver him from the evil that is within him. And that evil is the fact that a prophet of God has zero compassion. There is no compassion that Jonah has for anybody except himself. And I'm sorry that's convicting because it's very convicting for me. Many times my compassion is only for me. And many times I am just like Jonah. God, I want you to show grace and mercy to me, but not to that person. 
The Nelson Study Bible says this, the reach of God's mercy to the undeserving is a theme that continued to elude Jonah even as he experienced it. Jonah's experiencing the grace and the mercy of God and he still, still doesn't get it. So, God's still working on the preparation of Jonah, changing his character. So Jonah's very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, anointed. A, what kind of a worm was it? Worm. Name me a worm that can destroy a plant in one day. Please, please don't do any research on a fish or a plant or a worm. You're, this is God's activity. Yeah, yeah. This is God's activity. He prepares a worm, anoints a worm, sends a worm, and it is it so damaged the plant that it withered. Verse 8, and it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. Now, by the way, that east wind is the exact same word in the Hebrew for the east wind that came and parted the Red Sea. Do we think God's not at work here? So this east wind comes up. The plant dies through miraculous effort. And Jonah gets a sunburn. <laughs> God, God turns the heat up. That's exactly right. So he prepared this vehement east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And look again the second time. Then he wished what? God, just take me out. If I have to sit here and swelter in the heat, just take me out. Now, the nice part about Jonah is he's acknowledging who's doing this to him. But guess what he's not acknowledging yet? God, what do you want me to do because of this? Why, why are you putting this upon me? Um, well, let's see, you were disobedient, you ran away from me. You did, did time and time again, we're seeing this, that these are the things that Jonah deserved, and yet God is doing things in order to prepare his character. He wished death upon himself because of his circumstances. And I love what Ron Allen says. He says, the shoe that Jonah wanted Nineveh to wear was now on his foot, and it pinched. He did not like this type of thing coming upon himself. This is the first time, even though he's been through all of this, twice he has said, it's better for you to take me out. It's better for you to let me go, take me off this earth. And yet God is still not done with him. Look at God's response. Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Now, let's just take a step back. What's changed in this statement from the statement we see in verse 3, or in verse 4? The first statement is, is it right for you to be angry? This statement is, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Now, look at the comparison here. Nineveh, the plant. Nineveh, people, the plant. What God is saying is, you have more compassion about the plant than you do about all of Nineveh. Mm. You have more compassion for the plant dying than you do for everything I just did for all of Nineveh. Your compassion is not my compassion. You don't get it, Jonah. You still don't get it. And so Jonah says, you know, just put me out, just put me to death. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. Is it right for you to be angry? Yes, God, it's absolutely right that I be angry. Now, I want to just say this. We find from other passages of Scripture that Jonah does become a fantastic prophet for God. But this is the winnowing process that God is going through to prepare him for what's coming, to prepare him to be the servant that God needs and wants. Just tells you, Jonah was a, he was a diamond in the rough, but man, was it rough. God is just knocking the rough edges off of him right and left and right and left. But the most significant place that he's doing this is that Jonah lacked any compassion at all. 
And God's saying, you can't be my prophet unless you see things from my perspective, unless you grab my compassion and do it. And friends, we need to be asking ourselves the same question. When we get into circumstances, are we seeing from God's point of view? Are we addressing it from God's compassion? When I see somebody that I have a struggle with, do I see them as God's creation? Do I see them with the compassion that God has for them? Am I only desiring God's compassion on me? Do I step into that trusting that God loves them more than me, that God wants them with him more than me, that I need to see those relationships from God's point of view? This is what God desires with us. And by the way, it's really hard to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations when I don't like who it is God's telling me to go talk to. The absolute necessity of us to begin to see people from God's point of view, they are his. He loves them. He desires them to know him and to know his son, Jesus Christ. Have I beat that one to death yet? <laughs> Do we kind of get what? But the point that Jonah makes, and this is the point that really gets me. It is how many times I am Jonah. And when I see how many times I am Jonah, I need to go back and reread Jonah just to see what God desires for me to be. He desires me to be his messenger, to be the manifester of his character. He's built that into me to know, to have people know him because they know me. That's what he's desiring of Jonah. Jonah says it's right to be angry. <laughs> Tom Constable says of this, knowledge of a sovereign, compassionate God whom he feared should have made Jonah more submissive to God's will and compassionate toward other people and respectful of God himself. The Lord said to him, verse 10, you had pity on a plant <laughs> for which you did not labor. You didn't make it grow. It came up in the night and perished in the night. Should I not have pity on Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, as well as their lifestyle? Now, I want to put something to rest real quick. Um, when you see 120,000 here, there's scholarship all across the board. Some of it says there are 120,000 children, and that's what they mean by not knowing their right hand from the left. They were too young to know their right hand, so it's all children. The other scholarship, and that's where I land, is that there were 120,000 adults who were not mindful of God, and because they weren't mindful of God, they didn't know right from wrong. Now, I've been telling you all along that Nineveh is a town of 600,000, and that's what most estimates place it at, 120,000 adults and all the kids, and don't forget the livestock that's also continued or, or thought to be an extension of the people there. This is a massive city, and it's a massive city that could not tell right from wrong. Why? Because who had they turned away from? Turned away from God. Romans 1 tells us you can turn so far away from God that wrong becomes right and right becomes wrong. You can't tell. So look at how this little book has ended. There's only two books that end in a question. This and the book of Nahum, they both end in a question, and they both relate to Nineveh. Isn't that an interesting fact? But look at how Jonah leaves this. God says, should I not pity, pity Nineveh, that great city? Should I not pity them? And the answer is yes. Pity can also be translated compassion. Should I not have compassion on this city, a city in which there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who can't tell right from wrong? They don't understand it. They don't get it. That's a city I need to have compassion on. And Jonah, I sent you to deliver a message. The question that comes up in the scholarship is this. Did Jonah ever get it? Did he ever fully understand and align with God's compassion? And I'm going to tell you I think he did for two reasons. Number one, we see in other passages of Scripture that Jonah became, Second Kings for one, that Jonah became a great prophet that God used mightily. Did I tell you he got it? Yeah. 
But I think there's a second reason. Who wrote this book? Jonah. What Jonah gives us is this open-ended statement that says, I wrote this book to show you how far I had gone from God, to get you to see what God will do to bring you back to him. Jonah gets it because he's not afraid to put down in writing how wildly off track he was to show you how compassionate God is to bring you patiently, lovingly, gracefully, mercifully back to himself. Do I think he got it? 100%. And I think we have the written word to tell us this is why we know he got it, because he leaves it open-ended. And the reason he leaves it open-ended, I believe fully, is we have to answer this question. Do I have the compassion of God? Do I have the same compassion that God had on the Ninevites, that God had on Jonah, that God had on the sailors, that God had across the board? Do I have the compassion of God on the people he puts in my path? That's the question that Jonah leaves open-ended for us. And God says, should I not have compassion? He's really asking the question, should you not have the compassion that I have placed in you for my creation? Mark? Yes. Are you saying that God is asking that question, but Jonah is also asking that question mm-hmm. in his heart? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. So it's meant for generations down. And I think that's a huge part of why Jonah writes this book and leaves it not with, mm-hmm. notice he doesn't answer that question. God says, should I not have compassion? The answer is yes. Mm-hmm. But then the question that remains is, and it's really this question, has he had compassion on you? If he has, should I not have compassion on others? So we we should walk through this. In fact, let me read this quote from Frank Gabling. He writes a great little commentary in this book. It is not only the unbelievers of Nineveh of the let me restart that again. It is not only the unbelievers of the Ninevehs of today who need to repent. It is also we who are modern Jonas. For no one begins to understand this profound and searching little book unless he discovers the Jonah in himself and then repentantly lays hold upon the boundless grace of God. Until we see Jonah in ourselves and move from that to the grace of God so abundant in our lives, we won't get it. And his whole point here is. When you begin to get it, you will begin to see the grace of God overwhelmingly poured upon you. And that side of who we are, that Jonah in us, that God so desperately wants to change, we will see God's perspective of grace and compassion instead of Jonah. He wants to change us from being modern-day Jonas. He wants to change us into compassionate, gracious merciful, loving, image bearers of God. And if you don't believe that, let me just read to you the verse that should tell you this across the board, and everybody knows this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Do you think God has compassion on you? What Jonah calls us to is to be the compassionate representative of God because Christ died for us. The compassion of God toward us is overwhelming. Will it affect us today? And if so, how? Jonah, four little chapters, a fantastic little book that I challenge you to read again and again and again, especially when you find yourself acting like Joan. (laughs) (laughs) Questions, thoughts, comments, complaints, queries, anybody online? What well, nobody else is going to say. I had an interesting thing happen this week that is just, my eyes are just boring. Um, 
I have a granddaughter that's going through some hard times right now. It's not any, it's the little one I got in China. And um, I remember Wednesday night after talking to another granddaughter and crying over her and laying face down and saying, Lord, forgive me for not praying for her mom, mm -hmm. for her salvation, because right. things would have been a lot different if she had come to you. And this child would have had compassion. There's, well, she would have had compassion on this child. And just you talking about this, I I prayed a few little arrow prayers for her to be saved, but she was pretty mean. She's identified, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and now I am so convicted because it's not only for her good and his glory, but it's for the good of all those children. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm really convicted by mm -hmm. this because I was always, I mean, you people who've known me all along, you know what all I went through with her. And now I, I see these children that are suffering because she didn't. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, God. <laughs> Yeah. And so once again, God, it's your fault. It is. <laughs> but you know, the, the beautiful thing about God, and thank you for sharing that story, but the beautiful thing about God is there's always hope. At, at any moment, there's hope. Anything can change for anyone at any time. Um, being a hospice chaplain, we countless times saw people on their deathbed who had been vehemently opposed to God who came to Christ because God was merciful enough to kind of lift the curtain back spiritually and say, you got a choice here. Um, we never know. And, and if God is magnificent enough to save all of Nineveh, and by the way, gracious enough and patient enough to not destroy Jonah at every step of the way, then what we really begin to see perspective-wise is that God desires to see a shift and a change in us so that we will become who he created us to be, the image bearers of God. There's always hope because God's the one who's in, in control of it. So. This is why it's so important to come to Bible study. I don't care if you feel like you've been to Bible study every day of your entire life, you will still learn something yes. every time you have study. I, that's a wonderful point. I had a um, one of the most revered professors at Dallas Seminary was a guy named Howard Hendricks. And Howard Hendricks, you could see him whenever you saw him in public and he was sitting in an audience listening to somebody speak. He always had a notepad in front of him. And somebody asked him one day, why do you do that? And he said, because I can always learn something, no matter how good or no matter how bad they are. Yes. I can always learn something. So he constantly had a notepad writing notes. I wish I'd taken up that practice. But, you know, if a guy like that who is yeah. as knowledgeable of the scriptures as he was said, I can always learn something, then God never tires of teaching us. Paul tells us in Philippians, it's not a problem for me to go back to the basics with you. In fact, the first basic he tells you is rejoice in the Lord. Your starting place is to rejoice in the Lord. What did Jonah not do? Uh, you ever seen rejoicing in the Lord? Imagine what had shifted in Jonah if he had rejoiced in the Lord for saving him, for saving the sailors, for saving the Ninevites, for bringing a plan for across the board. If Jonah had had that rejoicing heart, imagine how this story would have been rewritten. So, great point. Yes. I um, love to tell myself <laughs> that um, it's righteous indignation when there's something going on that's really not good and kind of waiting to see the outcome, but doing a Jonah thing in my heart and basically going, you know, not wanting them to be smoked, but maybe a little singeing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. and, and not, you know, really dealing with the fact that it's the gigantic plank in my eye that mm -hmm. I'm looking at the splinter over here and can't see because of my plank. Mm -hmm. But what I'm wondering is, what does the scholarship say if 
God had called Jonah to this, and God foreknew that the Ninevites were not going to repent. They were not going to turn away from their evil ways. What would Jonah's countenance have looked like had they not repented? And hmm, what, what difference does that make? Does that make a difference when we are in our Jonah positions with people and circumstances? And we're, we're doing a little bit of the secret smoke hope. And, but at the same time, you don't want them to just all the way smoke, but maybe just, you know, the singeing thing, just so they have a little bit of payment. How would this have looked different if the Ninevite had not repented? Well, you've got a couple of things that you're, you're playing theologically with. Uh, <laughs> the first one is that God lives outside of time and space, so he, he absolutely knew. Right. Second, the whole issue of this, the, the entire issue of this book is not Jonah. The issue of this book is God, and it is God showing his compassion over and over and over and over again. And I think if, if, they, if the Ninevites had not come to repentance, the focus is still going to be God and his compassion. Maybe he would have taken Jonah and said, you're not delivering the message and brought somebody else in. The point was, at the beginning of this book, what's God's ultimate goal? Save them. Ninevites to be saved. And in that process, the sailors are saved, Jonah is, all this, the magnificent things that God accomplishes in this all takes place. Um, so from that perspective, if the Ninevites hadn't been saved, First of all, it's, it's pure speculation on what might have happened and what Jonah might have done. Maybe Jonah would have gone, you see? Ah, <laughs> I was God right. With me. Yeah. And if that's the case, I think then God might have said, Jonah, you're not the prophet that I want. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, you need to be singed as well. Don't, don't forget that, that his character is portrayed as evil. His character is portrayed as this is a sinful evil. And what God desires to do is take that sinful evilness out of us. Um, I, uh, let me bring it forward to today. Is there anybody that you're dealing with that you have any kind of an anger toward? Remember what Jesus said, New Testament, Sermon on the Mount. If you specifically, the, the, the scriptures say, Thou shalt not kill. But if you have what in your heart? You have, basically, you've killed them. You've murdered them. This is why God wants to deal so quickly. He wants to deal so completely with what Jonah is doing because we're missing. If we have that anger toward another person, we are missing God's compassion completely across the board. I think, again, if, if the Ninevites had been singed and Jonah had gone, yes, that might give us the reasoning to be able to say, God, go singe them. <laughs> Instead of, I need to change my perspective to see that person the way God sees them and that is he loves them and wants them to come to him. I think it could have been a radical change, which again, I think is why we see an open-ended question at the end of this book. And that is, are you dealing with God's compassion yourself. I don't know if that answered the question, but hopefully it landed the plane a little bit. Um, I mentioned to you earlier that I had read this book from the summer, and I thought to myself, oh, we'll get through that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you should know better in the study. <laughs> but what is um, through your teaching? There's a recognition that what may have been perceived as the major reason that we are to learn was far greater because God always has a deeper mm. and more meaningful mm. than we can even begin to imagine. That's Absolutely. Really, yeah. yes. and, and, and Annie, to your point, if you were to go back and read Jonah now, just with what we've studied, Jonah is going to open up completely different for you. Mm. And a year from now, if you're running into a situation, Jonah's going to open up completely different for you. Five years from now, Jonah's going to open up completely different for you. <laughs> this is why Proverbs tells us not only to study the word, but to meditate on the word, to let it percolate, in, to let it marinate in you. And Jonah's an easy book to read. 
It's a story. Mm -hmm. But the depth of what this is and the reasons behind why this is such an important book, mm -hmm. twofold. First of all, it points us directly to Christ mm -hmm. and the compassion of God on us. But second, it shows so clearly something God would like to change in each one of us. Because I haven't heard a single person any time I've ever taught Jonah, including me, who hasn't said, I see myself in Jonah, yeah. or I see Jonah in me. Absolutely. Is that a universal trait? Uh, mm -hmm. I think so. And given that universal trait, God desires to change that in us. He desires to mold and shape us so that we can do what he's asked us to do, so that we can be much more receptive to God calling us to bring the message of good news to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Needs to be renamed when you teach it next time. Jana, <laughs> Jonah, it ain't no veggie tale. <laughs> we'll take that under advisement. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I never got any of this when I watched Veggie Tales with my little one. <laughs> it's hard, it's I'm not sure that was the purpose. <laughs> so. It's hard for me to imagine. Like, I, if I put myself in Jonah's place. And God says, go to this city, and then the whole city is saved. Like, I'm like, whoa! Yeah. <laughs> but it, it was hard until, until this study, it was hard to think of that being so personal to Jonah. Because mm -hmm. it's when it's personal to you that it's difficult. Mm -hmm. no, and it no. really makes me think of the, the parable of the rich king that forgave the servant for yes. a little bit, and then that servant went out and, and had his, his little yeah. you know, bit that he was owed and had the guy thrown in jail or whatever. That's what this is. Yeah. It, it's not the fact that Nineveh is this big ugly, nasty city. It's the fact that it was personal to Jonah. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, a great point, Melanie. Take it from this perspective also. When it really gets personal to Jonah, is chapter 4. Yeah. That's when specific things that Jonah, I mean, you begin to see Jonah's anger. You begin to see him have this basically war of words with God. This is where he pouts. This is where all those, that personal side of it really comes into play in this chapter, and we're really faced with this question. Am I going to be compassionate, or am I not? Mm -hmm. That's a very personal thing, and you're right. When it becomes something that affects me, then I have to deal with it. And what Jonah has to deal with here is God asking him the question, are you going to blame me? Are you going to be against me, or are you going to be for me? You're going to be on my side and see it from my perspective. Are you going to care about people the way I care about people? Those are huge questions. And by the way, they're not questions, just so you know. They're not questions that you answer one time. No. God, I'm on your side. And then somebody does something wrong to you. God, would you send him? Yeah. <laughs> would you smote him a little bit? You know, God, for me, would you do that? I'm angry with him. And God says, you see him from my perspective? God, I really don't want to see him from your perspective. Please don't ask me to do that. I really want to sit in my, I want to stew in my anger. And I want to pout a little bit. And call it righteous indignation. And yes. call it righteous indignation. <laughs> yes. And it's righteous indignation because I'm the one who's been wrong. But have I really been wrong? Maybe I have. But what is God trying to do in me? And, and see, when it becomes personal, it really becomes, God, what are you doing for me? Rather than looking at it from the perspective of, God, what are you asking me to do? How do I respond to this circumstance so that you're glorified, so that you're lifted up? And, you know, I, I think it's chapter four, that one statement about in two verses, the word I is used nine times. <laughs> This is also, you see this in the book of Ruth as well, when Naomi leaves, and nine times in five verses, the word for return comes back. She goes off and does her own thing with her husband, but then for 10 years, she does her own thing against what God is asking, and nine times he says, come back, return, come back to me. Where do we find grace? Where do we find forgiveness? Where do we find mercy? Where do we find loyal love? Where do we find compassion? Away from God or with God? And yet, how many times 
if we walk away from God. That's, I mean, the message of Jonah, even when it's very, very personal, the message from Jonah is God loves you and his compassion is abundantly poured out upon you so that your compassion can be abundantly poured out on others. And I'll say it again, imagine, just imagine, imagine the change in this little book. If Jonah said, God, I'm yours, let's go. <laughs> Would Nineveh been saved? Mm-hmm. And maybe more so. More so. We have no idea what might have happened if Jonah had had it. I'm grateful for the book of Jonah because I see myself in it. Mm-hmm. And I'm grateful that there is hope. There is God who says, I'm compassionate. I love you. That's who I am. I'm also grateful that God looks at us and says, don't try to change me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> don't try to make me be the God who I am not. I am a God who is gracious and merciful and compassionate and loving and that's who I am. And when you when you have the Jonah attitude, what do we call the fish belly perspective? When you have the fish belly perspective, God says, don't forget who I am. Because I'm the one that wants to develop that in you. So you know, maybe if he had sent him to Cairo, he would have said, "Okay, let's go." You know, but it was it was Nineveh. Yeah. Because it was personal. But when it's personal to you, you have to remember it's more personal to God. Absolutely. Because they were not sinning against Jonah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, Chris. Oh, the question with the last question, like you said, should I not be concerned about that great city? It's just ringing in my mind. Uh, did Um, that Jonah in the mind shift of now having the mind of Christ or mind of God, uh, did not Jesus say these words? Uh, Should I not have compassion? So Jonah, like a type of Christ, finally gets it. And I can't, I don't remember the situation, but Jesus saying those words. Well, he says that a number of times, but just in what he shows, I mean, his compassion upon people that the world would say, is not deserving of your compassion. Mm-hmm. Um, the Gentiles, the outcasts, the lowly of the lows, the the sinners, the tax collectors, you name it. I mean, mm-hmm. Jesus loved um, to be in the midst of them, and there's a reason why mm-hmm. they had incredibly receptive hearts to somebody who loved them rather than somebody who hated them. Mm-hmm. You're the Ninevites. Mm-hmm. And God can do miraculous things with somebody who's willing to be obedient. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. great point. Any final thoughts? I have one yeah, other. Yeah, sure. Uh, where he says, uh, when Jesus, when God asks him, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? He says, well, I do. And I'm angry enough to die. I'm thinking of Jonah's mindset that he's, he's ready to die in his sin. And yes. God says, not so fast. I'm not done with you. <laughs> and the Lord has done that with me, too. Not so fast. Uh, you're, you know, you may f- go ahead and spew it out. That's how you feel. Get it out of your heart. Get it out. And yet, I'm not done with you. Yes. You're going to have a testimony. And you may even go back to your people and say, God doesn't make sense to me. He is merciful. To me. You know, that. Um, Wonderful point when you look at the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes really comes down to a very simple statement. On earth, nothing makes sense. In heaven, it all makes sense. God coming down to earth doesn't make sense. But if you could see it from God's perspective, it would all make sense. Why does God have compassion on the Ninevites? This wicked, wicked place, I don't know, other than the fact that he loves them. They're his creation. He wants them to be with them. As far as I know, that's the only explanation. Why does God have compassion on Jonah? It wasn't because he was a Jew. It wasn't because, it was because God said, I have work for you to do, and I love you, and I'm going to change you so that you can go do. And ultimately, is Jonah blessed by all this? Yes. Yes. But he can't see it right now. What's clouding his his perspective? It's his own anger. It's his own evil. 
that's clouding that. And I think what God ultimately wants to do, he really wants to kind of clean our windshield to make sure we're seeing as clearly as we possibly can. But who are we supposed to be focused on? Him. Yes. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians. We'll conclude with this. This isn't in your notes. This is this is a preview. Yeah, this is extra. <laughs> Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is what this is what I believe God was doing with Jonah. And it's what he wants to do with us. Look at verses 17 and 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit. So who's at work here? The Lord is the Spirit, so there's both parts of the Trinity at work here. Mm -hmm. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, what is there? Freedom. Freedom, liberty. There's the opportunity to work as the Spirit leads you to work. Look at verse 18. However, we all, who is he talking about? All believers. This is what the letter is about. Therefore, we all, with an unveiled face, now what he's talking about here specifically is in Moses' time, Moses had a veiled face. In the time of Christ, guess what's been removed? So we can see, the, see God. Now, we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. What do we know the word glory to mean? The visible manifestation of the character of of God. So here's what we get. We now have our faces unveiled so we can see God. How do we see God? Who is his physical manifestation here on earth? Christ. So we, with an unveiled face, looking as in a mirror. So when we look in the mirror, who are we seeing? Us, but we're also seeing Christ. So our intent and our gaze is upon Christ. And when we look upon Christ, what do we see in Christ? His glory, his character that is on display. And let's just talk about his character for a minute. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What do we see of it coming out of Jonah? Graciousness, mercy, loving kindness, slow to anger, and no desire to do harm. Character traits of God seen in the character traits of Christ. Now, when we see in a mirror and we gaze upon Christ, what do we see in Christ? We see his character. We believers are being transformed by looking upon Christ. We are being transformed into the same image. What's the image? The image of whom? Of Christ. And how are we being transformed? from glory to glory, from one character trait to the next character trait. So as we as we look upon Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to transform us into the character of Christ, one character trait at a time. So what's the character trait he's trying to change in Jonah right now? Compassion. He's trying to change that character trait that's seen resident in God. And by the way, it's a character trait that's been implanted in him. It's one of the communicable attributes of God that's in him. But he's now changing, and what he does with us is he transforms. That word transform is the word we get metamorphosis from. It changes us from one character trait to the next. And who does the work? Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's the Holy Spirit working inside of us that as we look upon Christ, the Spirit begins to transform us, one character trait at a time, into the image of Jesus Christ. What's he doing with Jonah? 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, by the power of the Spirit, he's working through Jonah to transform him into the image of God because it's with that image of compassion that he wants him to be a prophet for him. And the, the irony of Jonah, this is what God desires for him. It's absolute best. And Jonah's doing this, everything he can do to run away from him and be angry at him. Because what he says is, I don't want to be compassionate. I don't want to be merciful. I don't want to, I want righteous indignation. I want to sit and percolate in my own anger because it really feels good. And yet what God says is, let me change that. Because when you actually walk in compassion, 
feel so much better. It's not easy, but it feels so much better. And I can do amazing things with you out of compassion than out of your anger. Does that make sense? Yes. Kind of see that? Old Testament, New Testament joined together. It's kind of a fun little look at what the Holy Spirit does with us. Yes. I think it's just the old war of the flesh against the spirit. And it never yes, dies. it is. Yeah. It never dies. It is today. a choice every day. Uh -huh. Any other thoughts, questions? Book of Jonah, yours to study and go back and review time and time again. We'll be in Second Peter starting next week. Um, let me pray for us and we'll be out of here. Father, thank you for uh, thank you for this look at your your servant Jonah. And I admit, Lord, more times than not, I am Jonah. But I am so grateful that you are a God who desires to move and mold and shape me into your character. We pray that you would implant in us compassionate hearts for your creation. And that we would not let things like anger, circumstances, politics, um, office situations, neighborhood situations, we would not let any of that stand in the way of seeing your creation with the compassionate heart that you've shown us. May we be your servants in that. And may we be ones who, as we are transformed from one character trait to another, May we be ones that show your character to others so they might come to know you. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.